G'day Dave here and we're looking at Psalm 3. This is the first psalm that's given a historical setting and you can read it there just after it says Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Now those words haven't been put there by the publisher, they're part of the original psalm. And each time you see this after the number of the psalm, we need to read it as part of the psalm. In fact, in Hebrew, this would have been verse 1. It's a psalm of David when he fled from his son, Absalom. See, Absalom wanted the throne. He'd already murdered one of his brothers. Now he's trying to get David. He wants to be the king. And so you can read about it back in 2 Samuel, around uh, chapters 12 to 15, a little further. And you can read there about David fleeing, overwhelmed by all of the opposition. Absalom has gathered a following and they are trying to kill David. Now, I want to pause at this point because it raises the question for us as to how we ourselves read a psalm like this. Um, do we just plonk ourselves into the psalm and if we're facing opposition, we take on board these words directly? Do we make David's words our words? And what if there are multiple people in the psalms? Who do you work out who to identify with? Well, keep in mind, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are the setting given to us to help us to understand how to read the Psalms as a whole. Psalm 1 encourages us to dig deeply into the Word of God, and we discovered as we looked at this that the only one who fulfills that perfectly is Jesus. Psalm 2 introduces us to God's anointed King, the Messiah, the Christ. David is God's anointed. He is God's Son, but he never fulfills the expectations of God's Son. He never lives up to the promise that's given to him in 2 Samuel 7 of ruling forever on the throne over God's kingdom and nor did any of David's successes. And so we arrive at Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. He is God's son. He's the anointed king. And it's Jesus who can take Psalm 2 and pray it as his prayer. He can sing this as his song. And we need to recognize that as we look at the Psalms, the Psalms are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. It's his songbook, it's his prayer book, and it's only as we come to Jesus and as we put our trust in Jesus and see how Jesus fulfills these Psalms that we can work out what we should do with it. So I want to give you a three-step strategy for reading the Psalms. First of all, look to see is there an ascription, that is an historical context that's given to it. Secondly, as you read through the psalm, how does Jesus fulfill what's here? And then thirdly, as we come to Christ, how can we fit into this and how should we apply it? With that in mind, let's have a look at Psalm 3. First of all, verse 1, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. You get a sense of the opposition here, don't you? How many, how many, many are rising up against him. And it's a picture here of all kinds of opposition. There are threats to his life and there are taunts to him about his faith in God. God won't rescue you, they say. In fact, didn't they say the same of Jesus? Well, in Psalm 2, we saw the rulers banding together against the anointed and that's exactly what happens when Absalom pursues David. You can read about it back in 2 Samuel. And the irony here in uh, verse 2, where they're saying that God will not deliver him, is that here is David speaking to God, and God is his deliverer. And we'll see that as we go through the psalm. Verse 3, But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. David speaks to God as his protector, his saving God, and we see that again and again in the situation with Absalom back in 2 Samuel. In verse 4, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. So God is the protector, he's the saviour. God is the one who listens and who answers David's prayers. And this is a powerful contrast to what the opponents are saying. The opponents make it seem like God has forgotten David, he's not interested in David, and that they are more powerful. But David knows that God is faithful. David knows that God keeps his promises, and that he will answer those who call on him. And it's because David knows the powerful goodness of God that he can actually sleep at night. Now, 
bear in mind there is huge anxiety going on for David. His own son is looking to murder him and he's gathering uh, armies around about to take on David uh, so he can bring him to his death. And yet David says in verse 5, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. See, this is a statement of faith. David is trusting that God's got this. It's only if he's confident that God is in control that he can fall asleep at night. So there's no point in losing sleep and being anxious. One, it won't change anything or help him. It'll just make it worse. And secondly, it's to forget what God is doing. God is at work and he will rescue his anointed. We know that from Psalm chapter 2. David doesn't need sleeping pills. He doesn't need white noise. He prays and he knows that God is more powerful than even tens of thousands of his enemies. And then finally, he declares, Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Um, this is a pretty gruesome orthodontic prayer, don't you think? But he's calling upon God to act to save him. And you see, saving him will mean judging his enemies. As the enemies are overthrown, so David will be able to return into Jerusalem again be on the throne. And so God brings judgment so that he can bring salvation. And again, finally, verse 8, from the Lord comes deliverance, and then may your blessing be on your people. God is the deliverer. He is the saviour. And at a time of incredible crisis, David remembers this and he reaches out to God in prayer. And that's where blessing is to be found. Interesting, we've looked at three Psalms so far. Psalm 1, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in these ways and so on. Psalm 2, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 3, may your blessing be on your people. Here is another example of God's blessing. Now, what do we do with this Psalm? Well, we've seen the historical context. We know what's going on with David and Absalom. What about Jesus? How does Jesus appropriate this psalm? How is it fulfilled in the true Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God? Well, I want to take you back and then forward. First of all, back to 2 Samuel 15. And here in the situation and the circumstances of Absalom pursuing David, we can read in 2 Samuel 15 and verse 30, But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, his head was covered and he was barefoot and all the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. And later David arrives at the summit where the people used to worship God and you can read on. Here is David at the Mount of Olives weeping and praying. Turn with me now to the New Testament, uh, to Luke chapter 22. And I'll read from verse 39. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, and he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. You see, as you look at Psalm 3 and you go back to David, you can see David praying in agony that God might rescue him. As you come to Luke 22, you find Jesus, God's king, the one who will rule upon the throne of David forever over God's kingdom for eternity. At this point, praying that God will deliver him. And what does God do? Well, he doesn't rescue him from dying. He supports him as he approaches his death with an angel. But ultimately, God rescues and delivers Jesus from death, raises him from the grave, and rescues all those who put their trust in Jesus, the Messiah. 
So friends, when we look at this psalm in the light of Jesus, we see the one who turns to God and the one who relies on God to deliver him. The one who knows that God will defeat all of his enemies and the one through whom blessing is to be found. So as we come to Christ, let me ask you, when you are overwhelmed, it might be just the tough circumstances of life, young children, teenagers, trouble in relationships, difficult times at work, having lost your job, feeling weak and frail, maybe overwhelmed with opposition from other people, maybe facing serious illness, maybe fear for the pandemic and what's happening to our society, maybe persecution, maybe, maybe a whole bunch of things that stop you from sleeping at night. What can you do with that? Well, Psalm 3 says to come first to God in prayer, to come to your deliverer, get down on your knees, bow your head, plead with God, God rescue me from my enemies, God be with me and care for me in my suffering, God please deliver me and bring me to you, God bless me as I turn to you in Jesus. Use these Psalms as prayers. Come to Jesus so that you might be able to pray this as your own.